Hello, this is the next of our studies in Mark. Uh, we've reached March chapter 10, so we're going to ask the same three questions we always ask, and ideally pause if you're following along with me, uh, read your Bible, uh, go through it a couple of times, and then come back to hear what I've got to say and, and add your own comments below or drop them to me in an email or stick on whichever um, channel you happen to be watching this on. I would really appreciate hearing them. I certainly would. Uh, it'd be great to get a bit of discussion going if you're following along with these. So... March chapter 10, first question as ever, what stands out, what's surprising, what's maybe a bit weird, get a little mental list, go read through it, come back in a second. Okay, so here's my list, love to hear yours. So Jesus gives a commandment, oh sorry, gives a stronger commandment than the law regarding divorce. And that kind of stands out, he's making the law stronger, not what it kind of might look like he's doing and making it weaker, in fact he always does that. Um, and he seems to forbid remarriage, is that what's going on? And then, how do we receive the kingdom like a child? That would be a big question that I'd have reading this. Um, why does Jesus object to being called good by the rich young ruler? Why is that something that he is very keen to call out and say, oh, no one but God is good? What's that about? And, and the camels, the camels through an eye of a needle, very famous phrase, you'll have heard it before, but why? What's he getting at? I mean, I've heard lots of explanations. Which one's the right one? And he seems to say it's impossible to be saved on your own. Does he really mean that? And then James and John continue to get it so wrong, asking similar questions to the disciples before, who's the greatest? They're now like, ah, oh, can we sit at your left and right hand? I think they've got the gist of it from the last chapter, but they haven't. How do they continue to get it so wrong, is my big question. So next stage, as ever, what's actually going on? Take your questions, go back to the text, read the text again. Does the text answer your questions? Nine times out of ten it will do. What do we see? Okay, thanks for having a look at that. We'll see what I think and then again put your thoughts below. So, the, uh, speaking about remarriage, it's worth saying this is not the only word on the subject in the Bible. But Jesus' interpretation, his, his words to us should shock us. Because I think remarriage after divorce in, in the culture in which we live and swim seems obvious. But Jesus says it's not. It's not obvious at all. In fact, the norm would be you can't. And I think the scripture, um, in fact, this, what he says here would literally be, you never can. I think the scripture gives us reasons to think, I think you probably can in some very specific circumstances, but it, it's not as simple as we might make it out to be. That could be quite shocking. And the way he pitches marriage is probably not how most of us think about it, even in Christian contexts, and yet he is right and we are wrong. And then his pattern that always happens in his teaching in all of the Gospels of telling us what the law is and then making it stronger reveals that the way of Jesus, no, is not the way of law, but that doesn't mean it's easier or simpler. Actually, he says that wisdom, he reveals the wisdom underneath the law, that's what he always does. And while Christians are under the law, we're called to do more than it. Not simply keep it, but to do more than it through the action of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and through loving Jesus and thinking, yeah, I'll follow you, I'll do what you tell me to do. And then he receives these children. He says, we should all come like a child. What does he mean? Well, I mean, we could talk about that at some length, but on the face of it, at the very least, seems to mean a simple faith. A faith that simply says, yes, I want what you have. A faith that, yes, ask good questions, because children are full of questions. But at the base, just assumes, well, of course, God is good. And he's for me, and the kingdom is wonderful, and I should follow it. That's what he calls us to. And then he has this encounter with the rich young ruler who says, oh, you're, you're a good teacher. He says, no, what? no one's good but God. And we think, hang on, I thought he was God. What's going on here? Well, remember Mark's purpose that we've explored in previous videos. Mark is trying to get us to think, who is Jesus? So in Jesus', in Jesus words here, Jesus himself is trying to force us to think, who is he? Because no one is good but God. True. But Jesus, of course, is God incarnate and so can be described as good. But he's asking us to do the legwork there. So there's a sort of, you can almost hear the kind of ironic tone in the way that he puts it. And then he, he continues to teach. He tells the uh, ruler that which commands he should follow. He just basically lists most of the Ten Commandments, not quite all of them. Um, and the ruler says, I've done all of those, which of course won't be true. But Jesus looks at him, he loves him, he takes his word for it. And then he says, well, then sell all your money and give it to the poor. And that is a word too hard for him. And then he says it's hard for a rich man to enter heaven. He has to be like a camel through the eye of a needle. Now you hear lots of Christian explanations about this, including things like, well, there was a camel gate. And, you know, it's about going through this gate where you had to get low. And it's not that. Jesus is just using a hyperbolic um, 
statement, almost a joke, to say it's impossible. Essentially, you can't get a camel through the eye of a needle. You can't fit an elephant through a plug point. You know, it's that kind of, of course you can't, it's very obvious that you can't. He's saying something so ridiculous, of course you can't do that. It's an impossible thing, and that's the idea. He's saying it is very difficult, if not impossible, to be rich and follow Jesus. Which, almost all of us in this country are rich. Most of us in King's Church would be rich. We don't think of ourselves like that, but that would be the kind of world definition. If you look at other people in the world, that should scare us a little bit. What do we do with that? Are we using our money in the way Jesus tells us to? But of course the disciples then say, well actually, is it possible for anyone to be saved? And Jesus essentially says, no, it's not possible. But with God, all things are possible. His point being, you can be saved, but only with a gift from God. It is impossible to be saved without a gift from God. And then he tells them that anyone who's given up this, that and the other will receive more in the next age. But essentially he's saying, put the community before your family. I wonder how many of us do that? They almost given up mothers and brothers and sisters and houses and jobs and, and livelihoods to come and follow Jesus. He says, well, you'll receive more in the age to come. He sees what we do. He loves it. But he says, sacrifice for me. Put the community first before everything else in your life. These are hard words when we think about following them. For all, they're also a promise that it's worth it and that the hard road is a good road. And then James and John are fools. They uh, <laughs> they continue to uh, ask ridiculous questions, but why are they doing it? it was my question. Well, Mark basically tells us they haven't understood who Jesus is yet or why he's here. I mean, it's directly but after Jesus' description of what why he's come and what he's coming to do, uh, and that he will die and be flogged. You know, quite a lot of detail actually. That he'll be flogged and then crucified. Quite a lot of detail that Jesus is laying out. But the whole book is orientated towards that question, who is Jesus? And the whole book is orientated towards the cross. And neither James or John has yet understood it. Now, of course, this is James, who is, I think, the first to die for his faith, and John, um, who is the last of them, who doesn't die, but instead lives, dies in exile for his faith, who wrote John's Gospel and uh, the Revelation, the letters of John. These are mighty men of God, but not yet, which I always find so encouraging. And then Bartimaeus, after James and John get it so wrong, Bartimaeus gets it right. This blind man, so the, the ones who can see, can't see, and the blind man who can't see, can see. The blind man says, you're the son of David, with all the Old Testament allusion that goes along with that about who Jesus is and who that means he is. So essentially the promised king who would come to rule. And we see that declared in the next chapter, which we'll look at uh, next week. But, but he gets it right. And the whole gospel, as ever, Mark is full of people who get it wrong, people who get it right. And we're supposed to look at the people who get it wrong, the people who get it right. And then ask ourselves, who do we think he is? Even if you're like, well, he's my Lord. Yes, but explore what that means for you. Do you live that as true? And then our third question as ever, what does this tell us about Jesus? Press pause and go and write it down and then use them to worship. See you in a second. Okay, here's my list. Um, what does it tell us about Jesus? He, he calls us to better and beyond the law. He delights in children and people who approach him like them. He loves the rich young ruler, arrogant so-and-so that he is, get up right under my skin. Jesus loves him like he loves me, like he loves you. He's willing to gift us salvation that we could not get ourselves to. He sees our sacrifices and calls on us to make them. He knew exactly why he came and what he would go to do he had a laser focus, set his face like flint towards Jerusalem. He became a slave. That's I didn't talk about. That's the word servant should really be slave. He became a slave and calls us to be the same. And he heals the blind and the spiritually blind, like you and me as well. Even if we can't see who he is, he will heal us. So loads of challenging stuff in that. What are you going to do about it?